A bunch of us waited in a haunted house. That's the most succinct way I can describe it. To be clearer, seven of us waited in a living room from a bygone era. Fire was the primary source of illumination. Candelabras were disseminated on piles of books and the window ledge. Flames in an open wood burning hearth gave more light and served as the only heating in mid-October. There were cobwebs on the ceiling and a half-spent dusty decanter on a coffee table with some crackers and cheese set out. Refreshments nobody expected or wanted except for John Smith, noted idiot in a community already full of people making bad decisions. I was a wannabe amongst them, a recent high school grad with a romantic notion of thieves, acquired from a video game. This is the first time I've admitted that because it's embarrassing. I've actually never stolen anything of great value. One Swedish berry from the corner store when I was eight. A bag of chips from a party at seventeen. I got away with both surprisingly thrilling misdeeds. Social isolation after COVID and a shitty serving job motivated an excursion into the dark web where I stumbled into a nefarious and vague proposal. Grave robbers required. It was a simple request and antiquated like the house, a dilapidated Victorian tucked behind a cemetery so old there were soldiers buried there from the War of 1812. I thought it might be role-playing at first, but the messages gave real locations, an address, and a meeting time. Midnight the following week, the perfect time for those with a naive and slightly romantic notion of theft. I kept reminding myself this could all be for fun. I mean, why would anyone rob a grave these days? The proposal in a thief-for-hire forum also attracted idiots like John Smith. He was the only one who posted a real picture of himself and often argued with other posters over the tricks of the trade. His writing was so full of spelling errors that it was hard to take him seriously. In this room, however, he looked like the only real criminal, big and tattooed, and one of his eyes constantly looked half shut, like he'd been in a recent brawl. The rest looked as nervous as me. We'd been admitted to the house by an older man wearing a pinstripe suit. I thought he was like a butler or bodyguard past his prime, maybe. We were received from the veranda without a greeting or introduction and delivered to the antique living room, where we waited for the stroke of midnight and then waited some more. This is some bologna, John Smith said into his dirty glass of mystery liquor from the decanter. It was brown. Whiskey, I guess. It's almost twelve-thirty, a skinny guy with an oiled mustache said, pointing unnecessarily to the grandfather clock. He couldn't be a real thief. Too sweaty. A pocket door slid into the wall, and the man in the pinstripe suit appeared again. He smiled and bowed slightly, and a stale church smell drifted into the room from behind him. My apologies for keeping you waiting. He entered, and everyone backed away from him as he strode to the fire and warmed his hands. For an old guy, he was big and muscular, but it wasn't his physicality that made us give way at his approach. There was a calm detachment and authority in his bearing. Plus, he was the most handsome guy in the room. I am. Reed. The pause made it seem like he'd made up the name. You all know I've invited you here for a job, and you know the nature of that job, in part, is to dig up a grave in the cemetery nearby. What you don't know, however, is that the grave contains the remains of my recently deceased daughter, Elizabeth. His words were spoken so rapidly, it was impossible to tell how he felt. You'd think he'd be pretty torn up. He stared into the dying fire, fingers weaved together while his index fingers rubbed the opposite knuckle. Your task is simple. Open her casket and secure for me a vial of her blood, a lock of her hair, and no less than three fingernail trimmings. You'll be paid when the items are delivered. Nobody moved or said a word. Most had their arms crossed. And we get 5K? John Smith asked. That's not much between seven. Only I was able to see the old man's profile and the little smile he wore. It won't be seven, Reed said. 
At least three of you have already decided to leave, now that you know I am not kidding, and this is not a game. If you are not committed, now would be the time to leave. Go ahead, but be quick about it. Again with the fast talking, making those with weaker resolve wince as it overwhelmed their ability to think. John looked around. We all did. Who would be the ones to leave? Four quietly filed from the living room, into the hall, and out into the cold. John Smith, mustache sweat, and I'd remained. When the front door shut quietly, Reed continued. So it's you three? Good. He took a leather-covered box from the mantel and passed it to me. Inside you'll find three vials. One for each item requested, obviously. Do you have a shovel? I suddenly felt like an idiot for not bringing one. I have one, John said, in my car. The man clearly did not give a shit about being caught. Driving your own car to the crime scene seemed like the ultimate stupidity. Very good, Reed said. Please return before dawn. Her grave is clearly marked. She is the only Elizabeth in the cemetery. He walked to the pocket door, stepped through to the adjoining dining room, and shut us out. The three of us waited around like something else ought to happen. Well, I said, let's go. Rather undramatically, we shuffled out onto the veranda. John Smith stomped down to the sidewalk and turned around to look up to the high windows of the Victorian. He smiled and then proceeded to laugh his ass off. W what's so funny? Mustache Sweat asked. John could barely speak. He was in such guffaws. That guy thinks we're gonna dig up his daughter for blood and hair and shit. Are you fucking kidding me? His laughter petered out, and he wiped some drool from his mouth. He looked at me and Mustache, and his dull face became concerned. Don't you guys get it? We give him some hair and blood a toenail, and boom. Payday. He started walking off the curb, across the street, and to the open cemetery gates. What do you mean? I asked. What do you mean? He repeated back. You really want to dig up a body? News flash, dummy. It's super hard to get blood from a dead body. It isn't flowing anymore and gravity makes it pool in the lowest portion of the corpse. Throw in some decay and boom, it leaks out of the corpse. Stop saying boom, I advised him. It annoyed me that he seemed to know something I did not. Why would he send us for something we can't get? Back me up, Mustache. Mustache frowned. My name is Richard. That your real name? I asked him. He stopped walking and his pale skin reddened. No, he lied poorly. I shook my head. That can't be true, I said to John. He kept walking into the cemetery through the withered stones and weathered names. Mustache and I jogged to catch up as he struggled up the first rolling hill with his thick body. Blood congeals after death. Then the decay. If you freeze the body keep it preserved, maybe. But any decent mortician sucks out all the fluid anyway. So the chances of getting blood are like zero. It's pretty cold out, I said. Maybe there's a chance. I wanted to get paid and didn't want to deceive our patron. If I was going to be a thief, like the one in the video game, then I'd follow a vague and sort of contradictory code of conduct. I was still working that part out. Plus, there was something about Reed. His size and confidence were factors contributing to his overall clout, but there was definitely something more. In retrospect, it was like being in water with a shark. Not that I've ever done that, but once, when I was like eight years old, I imagined that scenario in a pool and freaked myself out so bad I had to get out. No chance, John said sitting down on a big stone coffin from two centuries ago. So why are we in the cemetery? I asked. If we're just going to trick him, I mean. 
because, John said, we need a spot to get our samples, and if he's watching us, it'll look like we really did it when we come walking out of the cemetery. There were a few problems with his reasoning, all of which I was happy to point out. First, we didn't walk in with a shovel and would not likely walk out with one either. His car, if he had one, had not actually been in sight of Reed's place. Second, if he thought Reed might be watching, why laughed her ass off in front of the house and then spill the entirety of the con, loudly, practically on the man's porch? Last, we didn't know the color of Elizabeth's hair. Shit. John's curses produced spouts of frosty spit air from his lips. What are we gonna do? Suddenly, it was somebody else's job to figure out a plan, and Mustache Sweat wasn't going to step up. Get a shovel, I said. Dick her up. Then we could get the hair and fingernails at least. We'll figure out the blood after. Mustache Sweat Richard looked like he might vomit. I don't want to touch a dead body. He gestured jerkily to the cemetery in general. Look at how old these stones are. They don't bury people here anymore. When neither John nor I reacted, he shook his head. I don't believe that man's daughter is buried here. John calmed down for a second to process whether or not he should resume ranting. Who cares? He made the decision fast. How are we going to get paid? Stop yelling, John, I said. His carrying on had stirred the nightlife in the cemetery. Bridal Vale Lake has always had issues with poverty and homelessness, but it had gotten much worse in the last few years. Drugs and their captives openly used in the streets and occupied spaces you'd never think to lie down. Like a cemetery. Rail fin shadows seemed to rise from the dead to view the Morans in their midst. The cliche fog of late late night or severely early morn clung to their legs like a faithful movie prop. There were maybe a dozen empty eyes staring at us from under the shadow of a large maple tree. Big man John did what a small man thinks big men do. What the fuck do you want? Money? Fuck off. He looked like an ape. A shovel bounced off the ground at their feet. They were giving us a shovel. Why did they have a shovel? Why give it to us? Questions that would remain unanswered. Thank you, Don said. He acted like he deserved their help and didn't hesitate to retrieve the shovel. His swagger vanished when he got to the bottom of the hill, close to the druggies. Clutching the shovel, he backed away until he was with us again. Those aren't junkies, he said quietly. What? I asked. Sure. He snapped before turning and walking away, while trying to keep his eyes on the people below. He plowed through a warren gravestone with his shin, and it snapped like chalk. Damn it, I said. Watch where you're going. The fact he nodded without any argument freaked me out. If they weren't vagrants, then who were those people? Guys, Mustache Sweat said. He'd walked ahead of us. I saw him looking toward the gates and was certain he was about to flee. He'd found something else, though. Elizabeth's marker. He didn't look happy about it, and that was appropriate. Her chiseled name and the fact she had died was about all I could make out. The year of death or birth might have said 1800, but I couldn't tell for sure. Also, that didn't make any sense. Reed had said it was his daughter buried here, and that she died like yesterday. But Mustache was right. They didn't bury the newly dead here. John Smith leaped on the shovel to chop through the grass. Hold on, I said. This can't be right. He didn't stop. The old guy said there's only one Elizabeth. So this is it. I don't give a crap about anything but the money, so. The scrape of the shovel finished the thought. John began to sweat and breathe rapidly. His progress was swift, like this wasn't his first grave robbery. I opened the leather case from Reed and found the vials packed in cloth. Nail clippers, scissors, 
and the biggest syringe ever made had also been included. I had to screw the needle into the plunger. John had tired of digging and conscripted mustache to the task. He winced with each plunge and wasn't nearly as fast. I got impatient with him and grabbed the shovel. He gave it up without protest and sat in a patch of wet grass. I couldn't go much faster, and it was John who lost patience with me and took the shovel. As turd-like as he was, John was certainly the strongest of our trio. He struck the casket at no more than four feet of depth. Then his feet plunged through the rotted lid, crushing Elizabeth's dusty chest cavity. For fuck's sake. He raged and I felt a little better, because his resumed assholery meant the encounter with the cemetery people hadn't permanently scarred his simple brain. John tried stepping out of Elizabeth, but the casket was as paper-thin as her, and he ended up stomping a lot of her lower body. John climbed out and used the shovel to remove the lid remnants and fully reveal the long deceased. I held the nail clippers and scissors out to him. Why should I? I interrupted his protest. Because you're already covered in Elizabeth, I said. He took both instruments and leaped back in, viciously stomping her legs. He cut ragged strands of soiled brown hair and explained how lucky we were that she still had fingernails. Fingernails decay slow, but they still decay. We're really lucky. John handed Mustache the hair first. I feel so lucky, Mustache said. I held open a vial and made him poke it down until I could put in the stopper. John leaped out with a handful of fingers instead of nails. He shrugged just easier. Well, they won't fit into the vial, I said. John handed me the clippers and I carefully trimmed up the nails, which fell off the fingers too easily. After placing the stopper, we stood around like idiots, wondering about the blood. Elizabeth's corpse looked drier than dry. No blood in there. No chance. We knew it, but discussing a solution required the sensitivity of someone with none. Fortunately, we had John. Okay, kid, John said to Mustache, roll up your sleeve. I raised the syringe, index and middle fingers, placed firmly into the steel rings on the base. Did you why me? Because you haven't done shit yet, John said. I nodded mostly because I didn't want to get stabbed by last millennium's needle. It was cool as shit to be holding it, though. Very eldritch Lovecraft without the racism. Guess I have. Ow, fuck. I stabbed him in the bicep, figuring it'd be better if he didn't see it coming. It was not. Retracting the blood wasn't easy, but I got it done even with his heavy breathing leading to the verge of a panic attack. I restored everything to the leather case, and John gave me an approving nod that I didn't need. The approval of an idiot is an insult. John tossed down the shovel and nobody griped about reburying Elizabeth. We got the hell out of there. The shadows beneath the tree had crept forward and their eyes shimmered like cats. We mounted the porch and I knocked. Just like before, Reed took us into the living room, where the fire had been built up more. I wrung my hands over the flames, but they wouldn't stop shaking. Very good, Reed said without emotion. He reached for the case. John got in between us. Whoa, hold on there, John said. We need to be paid first. The old man retracted his hand into his back pocket smoothly and produced a fat dad wallet stuffed with cash and business cards. He handed John his cut in cash, and John counted it out loud. One thousand... Six hundred and sixty-six dollars. We were going to be stiffed on two dollars. I didn't think John would be cool with that. Luckily, he was too stupid to notice the short. And smart enough to take the money and leave immediately. Reed paid Mustache and I next. We gave him the leather case. I guess we were more polite because neither of us kit the bricks even though the old man said nothing and simply watched us for longer than comfort would allow. 
Your hesitation suggests curiosity, he said. Would you like to see what these items are for? No, I. But he turned abruptly and made for the open pocket door. Mustache sweat followed like Reed had guessed his feelings correctly. I could have left then. It's a good thing I didn't, I suppose. Maybe I'd be dead then. Maybe that would have been better. I followed. Reed walked us through the dining room to a basement door and down some unfinished stairs to a dirt floor basement. There were tables and tool benches everywhere, and all of it covered in white tarps. It smelled moist, which is a gross word. Mustache blocked my way, lingering on the bottom step. Reed didn't notice or didn't care. He removed a tarp from one of the side benches, and there lay the cold, lifeless body of a child. That was enough for me, and I would have run if Mustache didn't push me down on his way out. Reed laughed. It's not real, he said. Come look. I went over reluctantly, and with slight hope, I wasn't seeing a child murder victim on display. It's wax over stone over plastic. As if that explained anything. The girl had no hair, no fingernails, and certainly no blood coursing through non-existent veins. She wore a black dress like Wednesday from the Adams family. I'd say she'd been crafted to look about seven years of age. That wasn't your daughter in the cemetery, I said as I continued studying the doll. No, he conceded. She is. He meant the girl on the table. But I required reliable people and couldn't think of a better way to find one. A test? Yes and no. I do need these items. Reed placed the case on the table, above the wax figure's head. But I'm going to need a lot more. A lot more. He emphasized a lot, a lot on the second repetition. Looks like you're the one. What do you say? I'm not sure what you're asking, I said, creeping backwards toward the stairs. He crossed the distance fast and clutched my tiny wrists in strong, dry hands. We'll see you in church this Sunday, he said, placing the antique syringe in my hands. You'll know what to bring, I'm sure. Be careful on your way out. He suddenly turned his attention back to the wax girl and the leather case. I'd been released or dismissed. Confused and relieved, I mounted the steps and arrived in the upstairs hall to a commotion outside. Somebody yelled and somebody squawked, and I had an inkling of what I might discover. I put my fingers through the steel rings and stepped onto the veranda to find my expectations realized. John Smith stood over top of mustache sweat cowering on the sidewalk. There were bills at his feet, and when he glimpsed at me, mustache took the opportunity to scurry off and begin a sprint down the road. We watched him go, and it took a while before he turned a corner and went out of sight. So you know how this goes, John said. Just give me your cut, and we're good. He held out his palm. Not gonna happen. I don't know how I said those words because I really was scared. The man was bigger than me and seemed to know how to throw a punch. Then this goes, he said, striding with confidence along the walkway to the veranda. I stabbed him in the cheek with the syringe. He fell backward and hit his head. Then he spat, legs kicking, until he coughed up blood and started breathing again. No, he didn't die. I looked around for witnesses, and that's when I saw Reed in an upstairs window, him and that girl of his. She stood and lived and waved, and her lips moved, and I couldn't hear her, but I could tell what she said. We'll see you in church this Sunday. Then she let down some kind of mental facade, some mirage, and I saw what she was briefly. It makes little sense to define things by what they aren't, because that doesn't tell you what they are. However, I can't do much better than that. She wasn't human. She wasn't a doll. She wasn't living, and she wasn't dead. She wasn't the porcelain skin she wore. And she certainly wasn't a little girl. There in that body dwelled an entity like no other, 
a homunculus housing an entity, an ancient foe my primal self recognized. I was currency to it, or, at best, a traitor to bring others of my kind into its ethereal sway. If I'm being vague and dramatic, it's because I don't have many literal words to describe what I saw. Imagine bleached white bones twisted around a torso, under pressure from within by a darkness so complete it strangled the light. There were eyes, too, eyes you could feel like a grip under your chin, forcing you to look into the abyss of its hidden self. And that is only what it chose to reveal. A moment later she appeared as a little girl in an old dress once more. As Reed nodded, so did she. I knew what they wanted. I took John's blood and left, stumbling around till early dawn, and realizing it was Sunday morning when I finally looked at my phone. Time to get to church. Which church? Did it matter? I guess it didn't because I picked one at random, or maybe it directed my steps to the right one. Nervous smiles under suspicious scrutiny of my messy hair and dirty clothes were my introduction to the Catholic Church. Parishioners guided me to a pew in the back. I still held the syringe, but I guess my coat sleeve hid it. Two men sat in front of me and seemed excited. They say he's a thaumaturge. What's a thauma? A fam. Thaumaturge. It's like a miracle worker or something. Like a saint? The other man didn't look certain. Now otherwise they'd call him that, right? Reed arrived in his priestly raiment to conduct the service and the men stopped talking. The little girl didn't arrive with him, and she sat alone in the front row. I'm not a Catholic or religious, so I didn't understand the rituals and didn't bother to follow along as they stood up, sat down, and knelt to pray. I waited until he came and invited me into some kind of dressing room. She was there, and I gave her John's blood, which she squinted into her mouth directly from the filthy syringe. Both of them smiled at me and stared and didn't offer a word until I tried to leave. We'll see you in church next Sunday, the girl said. I remember nodding enthusiastically. I go every week. I bring new blood. It can never be the same. I don't know if this is a necessity or a preference, or if there's a difference to a monster such as this. I prefer blood from those willing to give it. However, it's rare to find cooperative donors. The dark web is useful in that regard. John Smith offered his blood again for fifty bucks. He just tried to rob me or maybe he wanted revenge for stabbing him in the neck. Plus, it already has his blood. I know you try to help those who write to you, A.P. Clariot. Would you or anyone you know help me with a sample? It'll only hurt a little. We could meet at church. A few weeks ago, I moved to a sleepy little town called Meadow Lakes in Alaska, about an hour north of Anchorage. I'll admit, as a software developer, I never thought I'd be living in a remote town in Alaska, seemingly a thousand miles from nowhere, but I just couldn't refuse the offer. This hot new AI startup based in none other than San Francisco was looking to break new ground by gathering real-world data from remote regions of the world that have been mostly untouched by technology. The project pitch certainly sounded interesting to me, but I'd be lying if I didn't admit the main driver was a free house and a quarter million dollar salary. The move couldn't have been easier, too. I still lived with my parents, so there wasn't much for the movers to page up and take to the new house, and my amazing new salary meant I could realistically buy whatever I needed once settled in any way. It was a two-day trip from the East Coast to Anchorage, from which I simply had an hour's drive to my new residence. When I finally arrived around noon on the second day of my travel, I was pleasantly surprised to find that not only did all my stuff make it to the house, but it was fully furnished as well. A kitchen full of appliances, a living room with a sectional and recliner. Admittedly, I only cared about the recliner, but the only thing missing was a bed. 
Not a big deal for me since I was known to fall asleep in my chair back home anyway. No sense changing habits now. Just as I had come back downstairs from touring the rest of my new house, which was entirely too big for a bachelor such as myself, I heard a knock at the door. Upon answering the knock, I was greeted by a rather skinny, middle-aged man with dark gray hair and one of the goofiest smiles I had ever seen. Good morning, mister, the man said cheerfully. You must be the newcomer everyone's been talking about. Anyway, my name's Lenny, Lenny Strinder, and I'm your neighbor just next door. Feel free to stop by and ask for anything, anything at all. Lenny said in the sweetest demeanor, with almost childlike innocence about him. Then, Lenny's face immediately switched to a more serious look, and most importantly, do not under any circumstances answer the door at 12.4. After exchanging pleasantries with Lenny, I mentioned that I was tired from all the traveling, but I'd connect with him later in the week. Not answering the door at 12.4 seemed oddly specific, though Lenny did seem rather in some ways, so perhaps he was just warning me about people causing trouble late at night. This was a rather remote region of the country after all. I had spent the remainder of the day unpacking the few boxes of things I had moved from my parents' house just to get it all out of the way. If I hadn't done so immediately, then anything left in a box would probably stay that way. The sun had set at this point in the day, and I was settled into my new recliner dozing off. It felt as if my eyes had only been closed for five minutes when I jumped awake, nearly falling out of my chair, at the sound of a loud banging on the front door. Without thinking, I quickly walked over and opened the door. You didn't even look at the time, did you? Do you want to ruin your life? Lenny said in an oddly terrified voice. Whatever nonsense he was spewing at this point, he certainly seemed to believe it. All right, Lenny. I'll pay close attention to the time next time. I said in a rather condescending and annoyed tone. Lenny walked away with a nod as I closed the front door and made for my chair in the living room. Although Lenny's interruption was rather irritating, I'd always had a knack for quickly falling back to sleep more often than not. This time must not have been much different from the usual, because I barely remember reclining my chair before passing back out. Knock. 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 I was once again yanked out of a deep slumber by the sound of someone ham-fist knocking at my front door. This time I looked at my watch and sure enough, it said 12.4 a.m. clearly. Lenny was committed to whatever fantasy was going on in his mind, but my patience was wearing thin, and I fully planned on letting him know exactly how I felt about getting woken up by nonsense twice in the same night. A few minutes later, I decided to walk up to the door and say, Lenny, I know it's you. I remembered your silly warning about 12.4, so there... I waited to answer. Now can you stop knocking on my door so I can get some damn peace and quiet? The knocking had immediately stopped and there was nothing but silence. Completely uninterested in seeing Lenny's face again, I turned back towards the living room. Upon taking the first step away from the front door, I heard a chilling voice that seemed like it was Lenny, please. Please, I'm not playing this time. Something is wrong. I... I don't feel right. Annoyed at how much I cared about a man I had only just met less than a day ago, I opened the front door. Except there was no one around. I flicked on the floodlight, and there were no signs of movement in any direction. This needs to stop, Lenny. I yelled in both anger and frustration. Upon receiving no response, I backed up into the kitchen and slammed the door shut. I told myself if Lenny knocks again, I'm immediately going to call the police and let them sort it out. Upon turning around, it felt like my heart stopped as my eyes caught sight of a dark figure rushing towards me. Before I could react, something hit me in the head, and everything cut to black. I awoke the next morning on the kitchen floor with a hell of a headache, 
but my primary focus was immediately dialing 911 and connecting with the local sheriff. I told the sheriff about my neighbor attacking me in my own home last night, and to my surprise, he was there with a few other squad cars in about 15 minutes. As I frantically started explaining to the sheriff about Lenny, his stupid greeting slash warning, and the fact that he attacked me in my own home, the sheriff cut me. There's a lot to unpack here, said the sheriff in an authoritative but understanding voice. You'll want to come to the station to clarify a few things, submit an official statement, and sign some paperwork. I can drive you. This seemed a little odd to me, but who was I to question a small-town sheriff? After all, he and his team were quite responsive to my call. When we arrived at the station, the sheriff said, First things first. We need to make sure we're looking for the right guy. Look at this screen over here and point to the man who attacked you if you will. The computer screen he pointed to seemed relatively modern, but the photos currently being displayed on it looked as if they were taken by a retro camera. Regardless, it was clear as day which one was Lenny, so without much thought, I pointed straight at his picture. I see, said the sheriff in a concerned voice. I'll be right back. I immediately began to wonder if Lenny wasn't who be said he was or perhaps he was someone who had been wanted for quite some time. None of the scenarios running through my mind had prepared me for the old newspaper the sheriff handed me. Lenny's picture was on the front page clear as day, but the headline read, Local man Lenny Stringer brutally murdered in his own home. Further down it continues with, Around 12.4 a.m., neighbors reported yelling and screaming. No suspects have been named. I could immediately feel the color draining from my face. Was this some sort of sick joke the town liked to play on newcomers to scare them off? This couldn't possibly be real. Sensing my disbelief, the sheriff broke the silence. Yeah, this was a famous case back in the day. Poor Lenny was barely recognizable when they found him. They never did catch who done it, mainly because no one knew who'd do that to Lenny. No need to worry, though, that happened a hundred years ago today. Even if the killer was a toddler at that point, they're dead and gone by now. After this ridiculous story from the sheriff, I decided to ask for a ride home. Upon my arrival, I immediately started researching this Lenny nonsense. There was no way what they were telling me was real. And yet, every news outlet I landed on seemed to confirm the sheriff's recollection, which was far more chilling than the town potentially being out to get me. As previously stated, this was a few weeks ago now. I haven't been attacked, nor have I seen any sign of Lenny since that day I talked to the sheriff. Credit where credit is due, I'm likely attack-free since I now heed Lenny's warning. Every night when I receive a knock at the door at 12.4, I ignore it. No matter what sounds are on the other side, I refuse to answer no matter who is asking. And before you recommend simply abandoning the job and moving, this happens to me everywhere now. I dread the day when I accidentally answer the door at this godforsaken time and find out what happens when I slip up a second time. Back in the summer of 2017, I would have done anything for a Nintendo Switch. But no matter how hard I tried, I could never get my hands on one. To make matters worse, one of my friends managed to get one, and I was suffering from major FOMO. My friend would constantly send me texts about how awesome the system was and how Breath of the Wild was the best game he'd ever played. I became desperate to get one. It got to the point where I would just spend hours refreshing tracking sites to see if any stores near me had restocked. Then one night, just when I was beginning to lose all hope, I refreshed the tracking site one last time and got a hit. There was a Walmart in Janesville, Wisconsin that had just restocked. I called the store immediately and asked if they could hold on to one of the consoles for me. The employee on the other end told me he couldn't, and that it was a first-come, first-serve kind of deal. 
He also told me that they had restocked with only two consoles, and there was a chance they'd be gone before the store closes at 11 p.m. Janesville was an hour and a half from where I lived. At the time of the call, it was 9.5 p.m. I could wait until tomorrow to call again, and if they were still stocked, I would drive over. Or I could drive over tonight, get there just before they close, and pray that the console was still there. I made up my mind almost immediately. I'll be there tonight, I said. Then I hung up and ran to my car. About a half hour into the drive, I noticed something that almost made me lose control of the wheel. My phone was nearly dead, and I hadn't brought a cord to charge it. In my rush to get to the Walmart, it never even occurred to me to check my phone's battery. I had never driven to Janesville before, and was using my phone's GPS for directions. Two minutes later, my phone was dead. As I watched its screen go black, my heart sank. I had no idea how to get to Janesville. I stopped at the nearest gas station and ran inside, hoping that the attendant there could give me directions. The employee at the counter was an elderly man with a name tag that read, I, my name is George. I asked George for directions to Janesville. He smiled, revealing a dark mouth with few teeth, and began to scribble down directions onto a notepad. As he was writing, his tongue would constantly jab out of the side his mouth, licking the corner of his lips. Just follow this, George said in a high and reedy voice. It will get you to where you need to be. Exactly where you need to be. Thank you so much, I said grabbing the piece of paper like a beggar reaching for change. You're a big help. Sure, George said giving me another toothless smile. The fluorescent light above his head began to flicker. I started to feel uneasy and remembered that the store closes at 11. I gave George a wave and ran out of the gas station. I got back onto the road and started following the directions that George had given me. After driving for a few minutes, I started to feel that something was wrong because George's directions had taken me off the highway and onto secluded back roads but because these were the directions he had given me and having never been to Janesville, I figured that maybe this is exactly where my GPS would have taken me anyways. I continued on and followed George's directions to a T. My car's clock said it was 10.37 when I reached the place that should have been Janesville at least according to George's directions. Plenty of time to get to the Walmart. But when I was passing by the town sign, my heart sank for a second time. The sign didn't say, Welcome to Janesville, Wisconsin. It said, Welcome to Kangaroo, Wisconsin. I checked George's notes again, wondering if I had made some mistake. I was supposed to be in Janesville. I had followed the directions perfectly. I had never even heard of Kangaroo, Wisconsin before. My cheeks began to burn red as I thought that George had played some kind of trick on me and it was most likely I would not make it to Janesville in time now. I slammed my fist onto my steering wheel, causing my car horn to blast. I considered turning back, but decided to drive around, hoping desperately that maybe Kangaroo had its own Walmart, and maybe by some stroke of luck I could get a switch there. Or maybe Kangaroo was a village right outside Janesville, and I was closer than I thought. The first thing I noticed about the town of Kangaroo is how damn quiet it was. I was from Madison. Not a huge city compared to other places in the U.S., but big enough that you got used to hearing sounds at all hours of the night. There was nothing like that in Kangaroo. No married couples shouting at each other. No doors slamming shut. Not even any dogs barking or crickets chirping. It was dead quiet. As I drove deeper into the town, I eventually came across a diner. Seeing the diner made my cheeks go red again. The place was called George's Diner. A coincidence, I tried to tell myself. There was a red neon sign hanging outside the diner that read, Open 24 Ehowars. The neon sign flickered, as if it was going to go out at any second. 
Through the diner windows I could see a waitress at the counter and a man sitting in one of the booths. It was now 10.48 p.m. I decided to go in and to see if anyone in the diner could tell me how far Janesville was. When I walked through the diner doors, the bell above the door gave a short, dull ring. I rubbed my eyes as I stared into the diner, because I couldn't quite believe what I was seeing. I could feel a yell building up in my throat, but I suppressed it with a nervous cough. There was a man and woman in the diner, only there really wasn't. They were both mannequins, like the kind you see at a department store. From outside, I hadn't been able to tell through the foggy diner windows they had looked like real people, but there was no mistaking it when inside. They were just mannequins posing. The one at the counter was wearing a blue waitress outfit, and the one in the booth was wearing a trucker jacket and faded jeans. Hello, I called into the diner, yelling past the mannequins. Is anyone here? There came no response. I walked over to the mannequin sitting in the booth, and to my astonishment, I saw that he had real coffee. It was still hot as there was steam rising out of the cup. The mannequin sat there silently, staring across table, one frozen hand resting on the coffee cup, as if he were about to take a sip before I rudely interrupted. Hello, I said, turning back towards the kitchen. Seriously, is anyone here? I'm kind of lost. Hello. I considered going into the kitchen when I heard a sound. I turned towards the counter where the waitress mannequin was. At first everything seemed to be exactly as it had been, but then I noticed something. And this time, I did yell. When I had walked into the diner, the waitress mannequin had been staring in front of her almost as if she had been chatting with the trucker mannequin in the booth, or at least posed to look that way. But now her head was turned, turned towards me. I heard another noise and quickly turned towards the trucker mannequin who was still sitting in the booth, but his head was now facing my direction. No fucking way, I croaked in a breathless voice. When I looked back at the waitress mannequin, she was even closer to me now as if she had been walking towards me, but stopped right in her tracks when I put my eyes on her. The mannequins were moving, actually moving, just not when I looked at them. I heard the sound of leather squeaking, the unmistakable sound of someone getting out of a booth and knew it was the trucker mannequin. And sure enough, when I turned to look, he was standing now, right outside his booth, holding the coffee cup in one hand. The arm holding the cup was bent back in a strange position, the way a pitcher looks just before throwing a fast ball. A sound came from behind the counter, and I thought I heard something coming from the kitchen as well. I didn't turn to look. Instead, I ran from the diner. As I did, I heard what sounded like a coffee cup smashing as it hit the door behind me. Halfway to my car, I turned back to look. Both the waitress and the trucker were standing frozen at the diner door. The waitress had her hand outstretched, as if she were calling to me. Their frozen white mannequin faces were expressionless. The flickering neon sign covered them both in red light. I turned away, getting into my car, and when I looked up, the two mannequins were no longer at the door. I could see them through the foggy diner windows. The trucker was back at his booth, and the waitress was back behind the counter. Only now she was holding a phone to her ear, her vacant eyes staring out the window. Her frozen mouth never moved. I put the car in ignition and drove. I tried to backtrack my way out of the town, but the more I drove, the more confused I become. It was like driving through a maze. Even worse was that the town was still dead silent, but as I drove past homes and buildings, I noticed faces in the windows. Frozen white mannequin faces. I turned a corner and fear struck me. There were two mannequins standing on the corner of the street, right under the street light. One was wearing a red shirt, the other wearing blue. Neither was facing me. It looked like two men just catching up. Keep your eyes on them.
Just keep your eyes on them, I said to myself, not daring to look away. But then I heard what sounded like footsteps. Footsteps rushing towards my car. I turned to look out the driver window, and there was a mannequin there. Its arm raised, holding a hammer as if to smash my window. It stood there frozen. If I had been a second late, it would have broken the window. Then I heard more footsteps, coming from where the mannequins under the streetlight had been standing. I floored the car and not daring to take my eyes off the mannequin with the hammer. I heard the sound of thudding as I hit something, and then I peeled around the street corner and took off. When I looked back through the rearview mirror, I saw something that truly sent a chill down my spine. The mannequin in the blue shirt was splayed on the road. The one holding the hammer and the one in the red shirt stood over him, staring at me driving away. But they weren't alone. There were dozens of mannequins on the road now. Some were frozen in positions that looked as if they had been sprinting after my car. And there were others standing frozen, stepping out of the shadows of the trees that surrounded the street, as if they had been hiding there all along waiting, waiting to ambush me. I drove on. There is no such place as Kangaroo, Wisconsin. That's what I learned when I finally made it out of that town that accursed maze. I had driven for what felt like hours, dodging mannequins left and right, before I made it back onto the road and eventually back onto the highway. Kangaroo, Wisconsin doesn't yield any search results and no one I talked to has ever heard of it. But I was there. I know it exists. I no longer have the directions that George had given me as I threw them away shortly after getting back. George was the only person I knew of who had to know what kangaroo was. A couple of days after my experience, I finally gained the courage to go talk to him. When I walked into the gas station, his time during the day, George wasn't at the counter. Instead, there was a young woman with a tag that read, Hi, my name is Sally. There was a middle-aged man behind the counter as well. He wore a straightforward name tag that read, Mark. Hi, can I help you? Sally asked as I approached the counter. Hey, I said, trying to sound as normal as possible. I used the back of my hand to wipe sweat from my brow. Even just being back in the gas station made me anxious. Is there a George that works here? George, Sally said, renewed. Ah, not that I know of. Um, Mark? Nope. Mark said, not taking his eyes off a sheet he was tallying. He looked like he was taking inventory. Are you sure? I asked. He's an older guy. Kind of has a high-pitched voice. Mark took his eyes off his sheet and gave me an expression that told me he thought I was the most annoying person in the world. Buddy, I'm the manager here. I do all the hires, and I've never hired any old man named George. I was here a couple days ago, sometime after nine, and I spoke to both Sally and Mark dig out short barks of laughter. What? I asked. Now I know you're messing with us, Sally said, beaming, as if she had just caught some naughty prankster. We close at 8.30 p.m. No one would be here after nine. I didn't say anything. I just stood there shocked. In my head I saw George, standing under that flickering fluorescent light, licking the side of his mouth. I know I had spoken to him. Nice try, buddy, Mark said. Now, if you're not buying anything, could you hit the road? I have work to do and don't have time for jokes. Sally gave me a shrug as if to say sorry. Nice try, though. I turned to walk away when Mark said, Wait. Hold on. There is one George I know of. Mark, come on, Sally said laughing. That's not who he's talking about. Well, maybe it is, Mark said, passing a glance to Sally as if they were sharing the funniest inside joke in the world. Come this way, Mark said, 
and he led me to the back of the gas station. He took out a key and unlocked a door that went into a storage room. There were crates of soda and snack food and other items. He lead me to the back of the room. There he is, Mark said, pointing to the back of the room. There's our George. Standing in the back of the storage room was a mannequin, wearing an old gas station attendant uniform. He wore a tag that said, Hi, my name is George. The mannequin's face was frozen in an expressionless glare, just as the other mannequins had been, only on this mannequin, George that is, there was a blotch on the corner of its mouth, as if someone had been scratching or licking there, and it had caused the plastic to fade. This the guy you're looking for? Mark said laughing and putting an arm around the mannequin. Behind me I could hear Sally laughing at the counter. Mark, stop. Sally called from behind. You're being mean. Good one, I said flatly, not taking my eyes off the mannequin. Its face was turned to the side, as if it had noticed something particularly interesting in the corner of the room. When Mark saw I wasn't laughing, his own smile dropped slightly. He took his arm off the mannequin. Yeah, well, I really do have work to do, Mark said walking past me. So get lost. I made my way out of the storage room. I turned back only once, just before Mark shut the door. The mannequin, George that is, was no longer staring at the corner of the room. He was staring straight ahead. At me. My mind has been overflowing. I can't seem to keep it to myself anymore. There's just so much out there that you don't know, that nobody knows, and I feel like I'm one step away from just losing my mind. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me give you some background first. I had just recently moved to a new town out in the Midwest for work. I won't disclose the exact location, but it's been lonely to say the least. Deafeningly so. I work a federal government job, which really only consists of me editing and proofreading documents, with little to no interaction with anyone else. My apartment doesn't allow pets, and although I didn't have many friends before I moved out here, I had just graduated college, so I at least had some interaction with other people. My parents aren't in the picture anymore, and my new town's middle-aged to elderly majority population leaves little room to make friends. My days consist of waking up, showering, going to work, coming home, watching TV, and going to bed. Every. Single. Day. The most human contact I regularly receive is clocking out at the end of the day where someone else may offer me a goodbye before I head back home. In its own right, loneliness is its own kind of hell. So you might not be surprised to hear that upon my finding a missionary standing at my door, I was almost ecstatic. I hadn't been particularly religious in years, but that was a trait I was willing to forego if it meant that I could escape this self-inflicted prison. A man around my age stood at my doorstep with blonde wavy hair, a welcoming smile, and pamphlet in hand. Hi, he said cheerfully reaching out to shake my hand. I shook it, and he followed up with, My name is Chris, and I was looking for more people to join our congregation. Are you at all familiar with the New Life Church? I shook my head no, but told him that I would be interested in learning. A complete lie, but come on. I'd been here for six months now, and this was already shaping up to be the longest conversation I'd had in that time frame. I invited him in, apologizing for the clutter of fast food bags that littered my coffee table and clothes spread across the floor. It's hard to find the motivation to keep a tidy house when the only company you have is yourself. He laughed lightheartedly and claimed it was nothing compared to his own living room. I laughed back and suddenly felt very self-conscious. Shit, did I even remember how to hold a conversation? 
but he pushed these worries aside quite quickly. He seemed to be quite eager to talk, and didn't mind to lead in conversation as I tried to hold my own in small talk, and answer his questions about my job, my move in here, until finally he relaxed and said, Honestly, you've got my hopes up now. It's really nice getting to talk with someone else my own age for a change. There's not many of us here in case you haven't noticed. I chuckled again and nodded. So honestly, he started, finally handing me the pamphlet. I'd really appreciate it if you would join us Saturday night. I'll save you a seat. Right up in front of the pulpit. I promise you won't regret it. The paper was plain with New Life Church, written on the top with For an Eye-Opening Experience, directly below it, followed by service times. Noticing that there was no address, I flipped the paper over and found a peculiar set of directions. Asterisk located in the woods off of Park Trail B Asterisk, three miles into the trail. Take a hard left past the cut-down pine tree stump off of the trail and follow the white markers on the trees. Asterisk you will come across a river. Walk along the right-hand side of it for another mile until you come to a steep cliff with the river running over it asterisk, there will be a rope tied to the side of the cliff face. Climb this down and circle around the lake and continue to follow the white marker trees until you come to our church. Upon reading the instructions, Chris must have noticed my dumbfounded expression and laughed heartily. Yeah, that's about the reaction I expected. Don't worry, I'll go with you on your first visit. You like hiking? I nodded again, slowly. I was familiar with the park. Some days if I felt really cooped up, I would go out and walk the trails. I never seemed to see anybody on them, and at the very least, maybe I could make a new hiking buddy out of the trip. They must be some kind of hippie, new age type church, connecting with God and nature and all that. But why so far? Why not carve out a straightforward trail if they're going back that far in the woods? While I was pondering this, a question finally made its way to the forefront of my mind. Hey so, I know. What's your church all about? The words stumbled out of my mouth. He grinned again, a sly kind of smile, and offered an irritatingly vague explanation. Oh, it's hard to explain it all with just words. You've really got to attend a service to understand. Shortly after we said our goodbyes, I agreed to attend on Saturday night. I realized he hadn't told me what time, but he assured me he'd come to my house to pick me up when it was time, and to just be ready. Wear whatever you feel comfortable in, no pressure. Saturday evening came and went, and soon it was night. I was sitting on my couch, boots on, ready to go hours ago, with the clock was approaching midnight, and Chris nowhere to be seen. I slouched on my couch, half awake, dozing with friends playing on the TV, when I heard a knock. Incredulously, I answered, and lo, and behold, there stood Chris, wearing a dark gray jacket and jeans with hiking boots, and that same smile on his face as the first time he stood at my door. Hey man, hope I didn't wake you. You ready? Now, I know what you're all thinking. That I couldn't possibly be dumb enough to go. But you have to understand, for the first time in so long, I felt a sense of... Adventure? Excitement? The whole thing was so bizarre, and my entire existence had been so unbearably dull, I tossed aside any sense of self-preservation, and well off we went. We rode his old rickety ford to the outskirts of town, where the park entrance was located, making small talk along the way. So, why exactly do you guys hold services so late, and in the middle of nowhere? I asked, to get you in the right headspace. Chris replied without taking his eyes off the road. We try to separate ourselves from modern luxuries during our services and walking the trail is a sort of rite of passage thing. Not to mention, being so far off the grid keeps services very intimate and private. Ha! Huh. Weird, but not totally unexpected. 
This confirmed my suspicions for the time that this was definitely some kind of hippie New Age church. But still, my best opportunity for making new acquaintances. I was no stranger to taking night walks and hiking anyways. It was one of the only hobbies I indulged in my solitude. Once we had pulled into the park and started on the trail, the actual hike itself was uneventful. Chris pulled out a heavy-duty flashlight and walked on ahead of me, motioning for me to fall in behind and stay close. About a mile in, I noted how dark it was. So dark it was hard to believe it was natural. The moon had shone brightly in the clear night sky, accompanied by a smattering of stars, illuminating the night with its light gray glow. But now, under the forest cover, anywhere that wasn't in his flashlight sights was pitch black. I if I stuck my hand to the side and looked over, it was as if it had disappeared, and the trail behind us immediately vanished into the black. It was as if the only space in the entire world that existed was the ground the light illuminated as I stuck close to my new friend. And I had to stick close or else. I too may be lost into that abyss. Chris stopped suddenly, and I nearly bumped into him, which startled me out of my neurotic daydreaming. All right, and here he said, stepping off the trail and standing next to a tree with a distinct white mark, is where we follow the markers. Stick close, it's easy to get lost up here. He finished, and I hurried on behind. I lost track of time following Chris through the woods. He seemed to take many twists and turns that I don't know how it was possible for us to not have gotten lost. But every time I was about to ask him for reassurance, he would shine the light on another white marking on a tree. He kept marching forward confidently, and I followed, falling into an almost trance-like state, with the crunching of the leaves below my boots becoming rhythmic, and my mind going quiet. Without hardly realizing it, I found myself in front of a deep, loud river, just as the directions had promised. And then, after hiking alongside it, we came upon the rope next to a small cliff. I don't know why I was so surprised. It was like every landmark we reached from that pamphlet struck a bit of anxiety into my heart. I guess even being out here, a part of me doubted the elaborateness of the directions and was expecting Chris to pull a gotcha moment on me or something. And here we were. Like I said, pretty uneventful. Chris had followed the trail from memory, hardly ever stopping even for a second. And now, before us stood a large white building that looked entirely plain. It was rectangular with a basic shingled black roof and white plastic paneled walls sitting on a concrete foundation. There wasn't even a sign. It was really kind of underwhelming. I don't know what I was expecting exactly from a church that held its services in the middle of the woods at night, but something more, fantastical. This looked more like a large storage building. The double doors were colored black, which stood in stark contrast to the white of the rest of the building and rested at the top of a couple of concrete steps, where at the top stood a tall imposing man, bald with a thick mustache adoring his face and dressed in a plain white button-up with brown slacks. In his hands he held a large wicker basket. Chris walked right up the steps and greeted the towering figure. Evening, Brother Amos, he said, shaking his hand. Brother Amos only offered a grunt in reply. Chris then gestured to me. This is my friend Alex. He's going to be joining our service tonight. I couldn't read the expression on Brother Amos' face. He didn't say a word, nor did his face change at all. He just looked down at me and outstretched his hands holding the basket towards me. I blinked, completely unaware what this gesture meant until Chris whispered to me, Sorry, I forgot to tell you, they don't allow phones during the service. Don't worry, you'll get it back when we leave. As I pulled out my phone, I was surprised to see the time. It was 11.30 right on the dot. It had taken at least twenty minutes to drive to the park, and we had been in the woods on the trail for eighty, least an hour. There was no way it was only eleven-thirty when we had left at eleven. 
Realizing I had froze up, I apologized and dropped my phone into that basket, while a large wave of anxiety started to wash over me. Yes, I know, only now was my brain firing off danger signals. Not when this random man showed up at my door and invited me to a church in the middle of the nowhere. Not when I decided to GT in the ACAR with said man and hike miles off the marked trail using the most convoluted directions I had ever seen. It was like everything hit me at once, and I realized just how stupid and dangerous this whole thing really was. I couldn't be that desperate for companionship and human interaction, could I? Still, a part of me felt excited. It was stupid, I know, but you have to understand. This was the first flicker of excitement I'd felt in so long. I was doing something stupid, perhaps dangerous, yet here I stood at the doorstep of this mysterious church in the middle of nowhere and night with my new friend by my side, daring to step inside. It was something, and it was the first time I'd felt alive in so long. So, spurred on by that feeling, the tall man's unsettling gaze, and Chris Pat on my back, I followed him inside. The inside of the church was just as plain as the rest of it. It actually looked very similar to an old Baptist church I attended as a child for my cousin's wedding. The floor was laminated wood, along with wooden pews with red carpeting over the seats. There were matching red carpeted stairs leading up to the pulpit. There were a littering of congregants scattered throughout the pews. Honestly, much more than I thought. It surprised me once again that there were quite a few older folks sitting in the pews. They really made the hike here. Another detail that crossed my mind was that there were no crosses or iconography anywhere throughout the building. The walls were plain, there was no design on the pulpit, just a flat block sitting front and center stage. It had just then occurred to me that I had never clarified what kind of church this even was. I didn't know if it was Protestant or Catholic, or a Scientologist or Jehovah's Witness, or any number of religions it could have been based in. The lights hanging above gleamed a sickly yellow, and a soft, sweet smell permeated the air that I couldn't quite place. Chris guided me to the front where I was pleased to find that the rest of the congregants were much more welcoming than the imposing figure standing guard at the door. I was greeted with a flurry of welcomes, and we're glad you have yous, and one cute red-headed girl, who looked to be around my age, even shook my hand and said she hoped I'd be back for more services. I was still riding that high when a man's voice rang out, Good evening. A stout man stood on stage in front of the pulpit. He was accompanied on each side, one by Brother Amos and the other by an equally tall woman. She wore the same outfit as Amos and was even bald like him. The man in the middle looked short in comparison. He wore a white robe that looked almost like a hospital gown and had a short, neatly trimmed goatee and brushed back black hair that showed off his receding hairline. Folks, as you know, tonight is a special night. We have in our midst a newcomer. He turned his gaze toward me, which made me self-conscious and I shifted in my seat. Who, by grace, will be received into our family? But only. He slammed his fist onto the podium, jolting me. After experiencing the full depth and transcendence of a service here at New Life Church, a couple people in the crown clapped and hollered, and I nervously put my hands together as well. Brother Amos and his counterpart walked into the door in the back and carried out what looked like a stone basin and laid it on the stage, directly to the right of the podium, setting it down with a heavy thew did. The thing was gray and ornate, with etchings and markings all around it that looked similar to hieroglyphs. At the same time, I noticed the smell in the room had gotten stronger. It was even sweeter now, sickeningly so. It was so sweet, I could feel it starting to burn my sinuses. I looked around to see if anyone else was bothered by this, but everyone was just standing there, looking forward towards the preaching, smiling in anticipation. So many of us tend to feel lost. 
The preacher started his sermon as the towering duo walked back into the room behind the pulpit. So many of us tend to feel alone. So many of us tend to feel trapped. But as we know here, we are never alone. A couple of folks whooped and hollered at this. Rejoice, my friends, into the world unseen. Let it shape you. Let it kill you and destroy you. Let it rebuild you in its truth. A smattering of sweat had formed on the preacher's brown as he dabbed at it with a cloth stuffed in his shirt pocket. Rejoice, he boomed, and the congregation cheered in response. At this time, Brother Amos and his counterpart returned back from a side door, this time holding a pig. The thing screamed and bleated and struggled, and the two giants holding it seemed to be having significant difficulty keeping it still. I looked incredulously over at Chris, but for some reason, I felt like I couldn't move. Something was pinning me to the seat. The smell was overwhelming now, and I could almost see a faint haze permeating the room. They presented the pig to the pastor, who withdrew a mid-sized ornate knife from his breast pocket. My legs felt numb. I tried to shout in protest, but still my throat was closed. The room spun as my heart raced. The smell of overwhelmingly sick sweetness overtook my senses as the pastor cried out, Rejoice! as he cut across the swine's throat and dark blood poured into the stone basin. As the blood poured I felt my mind slip away. Visions started to dance across my eyes, as in it felt like my sense of self had entirely dissolved. The color of the blood from the pig seemed to mix into the fog that now encased the room, leaving the atmosphere around me a dark red, nearly black. As the fog became thicker and thicker, I saw visions in the cloud. I saw what looked like men rising out of the mud with horrible creatures, deformed and distorted, and old holding on to their backs. I saw giant beings that looked more akin to mountains than living things, raise mighty hands and earthquakes devastated the land. I saw the damned, raising their fists, screeching their blasphemies in languages long forgotten to man as the creatures that I can only describe as demons left. I saw the atrocities committed by the human race, innocents tortured and killed as they begged for mercy, mothers being ripped from their children, and families so thin their ribs pushed against the sides of their skin huddled against a wall as they succumbed to their hunger. The demons continued to laugh. I saw the creatures they were here with us now, chiding us, laughing harder more as reality crumbled around me. Yet as I felt my perception of self and my reason dissolve, I felt an overwhelming feeling of peace wash over me. As this feeling overtook me, the fog swirled and the visions around me changed. I saw the strings that held this universe together, and the planes of existence above and below it, constantly tugging on each other influencing each other. I saw the universe start to form, in the formless void, something created somehow from nothing. I saw the unintelligible formation of consciousness in the first beings. I can't possibly relay everything that I saw. I don't think there are words to describe it. I don't think that given a lifetime I could describe to you the depth of and significance of that I saw in the smoke. The fog grew darker and darker, and at some point without realizing, the waking world and the sleeping consciousness of self collided, and I was out. I woke up Sunday morning in my apartment with what felt like a hangover. My phone lay on my bedside table, and I seen that I had an unopened text message. It was from Chris. He thanked me for joining him at the service and hoped I would be back next Saturday night. I'm sorry, but I feel like I've been in a slog since this happened. I can't stop thinking about that church. My work performance is suffering, and I'm making mistakes that I otherwise would have caught. Nothing in this world feels real anymore, not when you know what lies beyond. I know it's a terrible idea, but I'm considering going back to that church. I want to know more. I blacked out just as I was really starting to grasp the truth. At least there I won't be alone. I also feel the need to discuss what I saw with someone, anyone. I want to share it, 
I need the world to know, and words cannot do it justice. I need to show them. I had gotten it. After all these years, I had finally gotten it. Sure, it may not have been what I had envisioned I'd be doing as a child. But you know what? After nearly a decade of early mornings, failed investments, and scoldings by Tom, it was an achievement worth celebrating. Steve, you're late for lunch. My co-worker Tom hollered as he put on his sunglasses and chased after the rest of the team. It was a lunch celebrating my new promotion, and I was late for it. One second. I called back as something on my desk caught my eye. My cell phone was ringing. Nathan. Nathan was an old buddy from college who I hadn't heard from in years. For a minute, I ventured to imagine that he might be congratulating me on my promotion before realizing he couldn't possibly know anything about that. I should have just let it go to voicemail, but I answered it. Hey bud, how you been? I sat slightly distracted as I reached for my jacket. Steve, can I tell you something? Nathan replied, a cold, serious tone in his voice. What is it? I don't know if I should tell you. I didn't think much of it at first, because, well, there was always something off about Nathan. He was a good guy, but kind of had a loose screw or something. There were just certain things that could only ever happen to him. Well, that's up to you, I guess. I said, not knowing quite how to respond. Hope you're well, though. The thing is, if I tell you, it was starting to get a bit weird, so I decided to cut him off. Hey man, I actually have to run to a lunch. You know what, if you're not sure, maybe you shouldn't tell me. Ock? Yeah, I gotta go. But before I could wish him a final farewell, he had hung up. A few hours later, I was on the train home, thinking back on a rare, perfect day. Even Tom was nice to me. I thought to myself, something that had never happened before, on my slow crawl up the New York white-collar ladder. Things are looking up. But before I could continue to bask in a much-needed win, I was interrupted by a small vibration in my pocket. Nathan again. But this time, it was in the form of a text. Steve, let me know when you have a second. Nope, not today, I thought to myself, muting the conversation. All I wanted to do was to get back home, see Sarah, have dinner, and pass out. I could deal with Nathan tomorrow. And when I finally got back, it was exactly what I needed. How'd the lunch go? Sarah asked, the second I came through the door, remembering the occasion. Man, I love her. Honestly, pretty good, I replied with a smile, sitting down and taking in the smell of her mother's meatloaf recipe. Contrary to the sound of it, the meal had actually become one of my favorite comfort foods over the years and smelled like the perfect way to cap off a perfect day. That night, as we lay in bed, watching another trash reality TV show, Sarah passed out beside me, and I began to think about how lucky I was. About fifteen minutes into the show, I turned off the TV and drifted off to sleep, completely forgetting about the strange interactions with Nathan. The next morning, I woke up to a ray of sunshine in my eyes, as if the world was greeting me to yet another positive day. That is, until I looked over at my phone, lying on the bedside table. Eleven missed calls. What the fuck, Nathan? I thought to myself, as all my hopes for the day felt like they were just slapped out of me. I'll call him when I get to the office. But an hour later, as I sat on the train, just waiting for the end of the seemingly endless commute, I felt my phone vibrating. Seriously, Nathan? You know what, fine. I mumbled to myself as I pulled my phone out of my pocket. Nathan, what the fuck? Eleven, I mean twelve calls. I called aloud, 
as all of the other passengers looked up. What the hell is the matter with you? I was never the type to share my business on the train, but I had to put a stop to this. Steve, I really need to talk to you. He sputtered out frantically. All right, just tell me already. There was a brief pause as I looked up and saw at least a half dozen strangers still staring at me. No, you were right. We can't do this over the phone. Listen, I have to ask, as a friend, is everything ok? Are you ok? But all he said was, meet me after work tonight. Angry Donkey, before hanging up. Angry Donkey was the name of an old watering hole that we used to frequent right after college. A place with great memories, where we had spent more hours and dollars than I cared to count. While part of me liked the idea of seeing the place again, I found Nathan's cryptic behavior too irritating to reward with a meeting. No thanks, I said to myself, as things on the train returned to normal. The conversation had been a bit unsettling, but I simply thought, I'll just get lost in my work today. Be careful what you wish for. First day after your promotion and you're already late, Tom snickered. Before I could even attempt to explain my morning, he had walked away. The rest of the day was as rough as I'd ever had. Turns out, with just a small bump in pay, comes an unfair level of responsibility. And of all the bonds in the company's expansive portfolio, an oil leak in the Gulf had to strike mine, causing its price to plummet. Deal with this, now. Tom commanded, as I slunk in my chair, exhausted by just the idea of what lay ahead. I ended up working later than I wanted, succeeding in completely forgetting about Nathan. That is, until the train ride home, when, during a complete absence of thought, my mind went back to him, for some reason. What could this all be about? I wondered. What could possibly be so scary that you couldn't talk about it over the phone? Then I remembered. Nathan was a gambler. Fuck. That's it. This guy could end up in a pair of cement shoes in the bottom of the Hudson. I stopped myself from delving too deep into the nuances. I had a tendency to overthink and let my mind wander. That wasn't going to do me any good. I knew exactly who Nathan was and was definitely aware of his faults, but I've always prided myself on being able to see the best in people. Even in Nathan. Yeah, he might have had some addiction issues in his younger days, but he was a good guy. And back then, he had always been a loyal friend. A loyal friend, I thought to myself. Ah, oh, fuck. Ah, oh, fine. I called out as I jumped up and darted through the nearly closing subway doors to head for a connecting train to Astoria. But after two hours of drinking a $20 pitcher for one, the notion of loyalty was growing really old. I looked down at my text conversation with Nathan. Hey, I'm here. Where are you, man? You'd think after all the urgency, he definitely would have been here, I thought to myself. My mind began to wander back to dark places again. He's at the bottom of the river, lungs filled with water, long past the point of resuscit. I stopped myself. Positive thoughts, Steve. Positive thoughts. Everything's fine, maybe he stopped by before you got here, and had to run. For a minute, I was even thankful he dragged me back here. The place hadn't changed much, though the old bartenders weren't there anymore, taking away the feeling of belonging I used to get from it. A place really is defined by the people you hang out with when you're there, isn't it? I mused. Still, it was nice to see that it was still around, and if I'm being perfectly honest, after the day I had, I needed that picture. One more try, I thought, as I called him again, to no answer. Fuck it, I'm out. But by the time I got home, any feelings of nostalgia that may have been lingering had worn off and had turned into annoyance. Of all the fucking accounts to plummet, why'd it have to be mine? 
the day after my promotion, no less. And then there was Nathan. Where do I even begin? Sarah could tell something was on my mind. Steve, there's some leftover meatloaf in the fridge if you're hungry, she offered from a place of love. I don't want meatloaf. I'm sick of eating meatloaf every fucking night. Even as I said it, I knew I was being a prick, but what was said was said. Suffice to say, words were exchanged, and I slept on the couch that night. Laying on my lumpy sofa, I found myself unable to sleep. Staring up at the living room ceiling, my mind was still replaying the day's events on repeat. The bonds, fine, they're out of my control, but Nathan, I just had to stop entertaining it. Then, at that exact moment, the sound of a text message rang out throughout the room. I scrambled to put my phone on silent mode, so as to not wake Sarah. I had screwed that up enough for one night. I looked down at my phone. Hey, remember that thing I was gonna tell you about? Just forget about it. Nathan's text sent me into a rage. I jumped off the couch and had to stop myself from screaming my words aloud as I typed them. Nathan, I went to Angry Donkey and you didn't show up. What the hell? And then you ignore my texts and calls. This has to stop. You know what? Don't tell me. I don't want to know anymore. I'm done with you. But of course, he didn't reply. I continued to toss and turn, to the point where I needed to turn on the eight-hour rain loop, just to ease out of it. An hour or so later, I somehow managed to finally crash. Several days passed, and I didn't hear from Nathan. You'd think I'd be glad, but for reasons I can't quite explain, I couldn't stop thinking about it. What could he have wanted to tell me so urgently, but didn't or couldn't anymore? I kept going back to the mafia theory. My mind began to play tricks on me, and I started to wonder if he had gotten involved in some kind of CIA plot. But it was Nathan, what kind of contact could he have with a government agency? At best, the only thing I could conjure up was that he got drunk and crashed into a Fed's car, sensitive files spilling everywhere. My thoughts continued on like that for days. But no matter how hard I tried to forget, I just kept going back to it. What could it possibly be? And why haven't I heard from him? Concrete boots joke aside, I was starting to wonder if Nathan actually was in some kind of serious danger. I thought about calling the cops, but what could I even say to them? It would all sound so crazy. I guess I could tell them he was a missing person and let them handle it, but did I really want to get myself involved? I resolved to put the whole thing out of my mind, focusing on the fact that the oil bonds were finally showing upward growth. But yet again, I found myself wide awake in bed, thinking about it, and thinking about it, and thinking about it, until finally I sat up and said, fuck it. I did my best to keep quiet as I threw on a pair of jeans, but somehow in the process, my belt buckle accidentally fell to the floor, waking Sarah. Honey, where are you going? She asked as she turned to look at the clock. It's 1.30 in the morning. Can you just try to get some sleep? She was right. I hadn't slept well in days, too obsessed with the mystery. I wanted to tell her what was on my mind, but I couldn't bear to trouble her with it and possibly get her involved in the mess. I'm just starving, dear. You know I can't sleep on an empty stomach. We just ate a few hours ago. I'm just gonna run to get a burger. I'll be back in a few. I said, my words trailing away as I walked out, now fully dressed, leaving Sarah sitting up in bed, a look of concern on her face. As I drove over to Nathan's place, my mind continued to race. Sarah was right, even more than she knew. I had only slept a few hours in as many days, and Nathan's secret was starting to wear on me. At that very moment, I looked back at my rearview mirror and saw a set of glaring headlights appearing over the horizon, which seemed to be rapidly approaching. 
If Nathan was in trouble with the government or some sort of crime syndicate, could they know about me? Surely they'd be aware that we'd been in touch. Even though I still didn't know his secret, maybe they thought I did. And if so, could this be them tailing me? I have to duck them to be safe. But when I looked back at the rearview mirror, the lights were gone. When I arrived at Nathan's, I realized I hadn't thought through my plan very well. Encamped in the lobby, I kept tapping on his apartment's buzzer repeatedly, wondering if he was sleeping through it, ignoring it given the late hour, or not home at all. Come on, answer, Nathan. I'm just trying to help. I thought to myself, before walking around to the back of the building and looking up at his living room window. It was dark, but then again, if I was in some sort of trouble and woke up to someone buzzing me at this hour, I'd switch off all of the lights too. Then it hit me. A rusty stairway to my destination was looming right in front of me. The fire escape. Fuck it. I thought as I propped myself up on a trash can and hopped up to latch onto it. The initial pull-up was the hard part. I'll admit, I hadn't been to the gym in a while and definitely felt it in that moment. But luckily, scaling the rest was easy. I just had to be quiet, lest one of Nathan's neighbors think I was breaking and entering, which to be fair, I kind of was. When I finally made it to his window, I discovered that it was locked. Obviously, I thought, before convincing myself that I had no other choice, I took off my sweatshirt, wrapped it around my arm, and punched the glass, the sound of shattered shards raining on the pavement below, echoing throughout the alleyway. Arg, I screamed, quickly muffling myself, as I looked down at my arm, blood dripping out from the sweatshirt. Where did I learn that? I wondered, before whispering to myself, idiot. Within a few minutes, I was in Nathan's apartment, broken window closed behind me. I turned on my cell phone flashlight and, before looking around, thought to call out my name and alert Nathan of my presence. But I began to wonder if someone might have beaten me here. I went on an ultimately fruitless search of the apartment, except for a cryptic note I found on his bedside table that read, Goodbye. Suddenly, I heard the rustling of keys at the front door, a few rooms away. Looking around the bedroom, I spotted an ample amount of space under Nathan's bed and slid my way under, remembering to turn off my cell phone's flashlight. I then proceeded to hear whoever it was enter the apartment, close the door behind them, and eerily walk around, as if searching for something. I could almost picture it all perfectly just by closing my eyes and listening as the footsteps stopped by what seemed like the window. Then, they immediately crept to the bedroom and stopped at the doorway. From under the bed, all I could see was the silhouette of a pair of muddy boots, not moving at all. I tried my best to do the same, covering my breath with my good hand. Must have been my trail of blood, I thought to myself, as I looked over at my other arm, still bleeding. The boots then proceeded to walk directly over to where I was hiding, stopping just a few inches away. Fuck, I have to act now. I thought before awkwardly sliding out from the bed and darting in the direction of the kitchen. But before I could make it out of the room, I found myself tackled by the mysterious figure. Grappling for my life, I tried to kick them and free myself, but was no match for my attacker and ended up in a headlock, face pressed to the floor. Steve? What the fuck are you doing? The man screamed. That's when I remembered that Nathan had wrestled in high school. Nathan? I called out, unable to see him. Who else would it be? He shot back, before releasing me, my body collapsing to the ground as I struggled to catch my breath. I looked up at him and despite what he put me through, could not be more relieved to see his tired face, cold blue eyes, balding head, and lanky body. He, in turn, looked back at me, then down at my arm. Did you break into my apartment? Ten minutes later, we were in his kitchen, 
lights now on like civilized adults, my arm wrapped with a makeshift bandage made of several smaller bandages. Where have you been? I asked him. I've been calling and texting. I know, but there's a logical explanation for all this. Tell me. No, you were right. I shouldn't tell you, he said before a deeply concerning look washed over his face. Fuck, it's gonna rain tonight. He hopped up, threw on a jacket, and ran out of the apartment as I sat at his kitchen table, scratching my head. When I finally caught up to him, Nathan was stepping into his corner. Nathan, you can't just imply there's something you desperately need to tell me, then completely fall off the face of the planet and say to forget it. You have to tell me now. It was already in the car, its door closed behind him. My old friend rolled the window down. You really want to know? Yes. He stared at me, almost as though he was looking through me, before finally blurting out, then get in your car and follow me. About thirty minutes later he pulled off the highway somewhere in New Jersey. I had followed him in my car, careful to check my rearview mirror for lights, but given the hour I hadn't seen anything in the darkness. The city lights had disappeared, and the sounds of civilization slowly drifted away, leaving only the humming of my engine. Even the street lights were gone now. I had no idea where we were anymore, his tail lights the only thing guiding me. Everything felt like it was slowing down, but the slower it became, the faster my mind raced. After navigating around several winding roads, Nathan's car finally turned off of a main street and down a narrow, dirt road, lined by trees, as we drove deeper and deeper into a surprisingly dense forest. Eventually, we arrived at a dead end, and Nathan stopped his car, turning off its lights. I followed suit. When I walked over to him, he was glaring at me. But before I could even ask where we were going, he simply turned away and started walking into the woods. About a football field's length later, we arrived at a small clearing in the forest. Still without saying anything, he just turned to me and held up a finger to his mouth, warning me to keep quiet. I obeyed his command and stayed silent. He then proceeded to frantically circle around the clearing, his eyes on the ground, as if looking for something, until finally stopping. There it is, he mumbled to himself before turning to me. Any boulders over there? Large ones. Boulders? I thought to myself, before seeing him rummage through the forest floor, realizing what he meant. After some difficulty searching in the dark, I spotted a large rock, illuminated by the moonlight. Hunching over, I picked it up and proceeded to carry it over to where Nathan was standing. He wasn't moving anymore. Instead, he was simply staring at something on the ground. See, this is exactly what I was worried about, he said before I looked down at what he was referring to. It was a human hand, wedding ring still on the fourth finger, protruding from the ground, as if trying to unearth itself and escape. Rain comes in tonight, whole things washing up, hence the rocks. I dropped my boulder and just stared at him. I was too shocked to think, much less come up with something to say. Then without even being entirely conscious of it, I ran. I ran as fast as I could. Nathan simply watched me race away, before dropping his own stone and chasing after me. I shouldn't have told you. He cried out, hysterically, his voice almost inaudible behind the frantic sound of crushing sticks and leaves. I looked behind me, only to find his lanky shadow still chasing me, dipping and dodging tree branches and logs in an attempt to catch up to me. I just kept running and running. Somehow, I managed to get to my car, fish for the keys, open the door, and slam it behind me, as Nathan threw himself at the hood. As I drove off in reverse, he dropped to the ground, then simply stood up and walked back into the woods, his car still parked. 
I spun the car around and peeled off down the dirt road. Psycho must have gone back to finish his dirty work, I thought to myself, suddenly becoming very conscious of the fact that my breathing had calmed slightly from hyperventilation to huffing. He'll come looking for me. He knows where I live. Sarah. I've got to call Sarah. My mind was racing a million miles an hour. I pulled out my cell phone, which barely had any battery left from using the flashlight earlier, and scrambled to find Sarah's contact. Calling her, each ring felt longer than the next, as I tried to keep my eye on the dark road. Ring. 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 And then finally. Honey? Sarah answered, abruptly woken up and clearly concerned. Where are you? What's going on? Sarah, I began, but couldn't get the words out of my mouth. What, honey? Tell me. She begged. I remained silent for a moment as I attempted to organize my thoughts before saying the only thing that made sense in that moment. I don't know if I should tell you.